moving these bees into their hives. That's what these little channels are for. The little pathways that can be accessed from inside the cage, where the bees can travel up them and get into their permanent homes. By opening these things up, I'm really going to kill the population that's actively available for breeding at any time, but I think I'm at the point where I have enough bees that I can kind of stop breeding them together. I didn't know my actual bee count while I was recording this, but based on the number of flowering azaleas I'd used, and just a general feeling of how full the hive was, I figured I had enough. Even if I didn't have enough bees, it wasn't really a bad idea to downgrade anyway. After all, the only way to find out if I have enough bees is to downgrade to 1.17 and see if I can pull off the exploit. So I guess it's time to downgrade to 1.17. The reason I've been putting off the downgrade for so long is that the actual process of doing it is kind of messy. You can't just open up a 1.18 world in 1.17, because if you do, the game won't know how to read any of the block data. And what does the game do when it can't read the block data? Well, it regenerates all of those blocks from scratch. You'll see here that all of the blocks in their spawn have been completely regenerated by the game because it just doesn't know how to read a 1.18 save file. It seems to be fine with the entity data though, since I've got my inventory and all the NPCs are still around. But yeah, not having the block data is a pretty big issue, and I'm going to need to rely on an external tool to fix that. I won't go into the details too much, but the important thing to know is that everything below y equals 0 is going to go missing. That means the wandering trader farm, which we all know and love, is going to lose half of its blocks down the bottom. It kind of sucks that the Wandering Trader Farm can't cleanly convert to 1.17, but I think it's okay. The Wandering Trader Farm could have easily been built higher up, and let's be real, I absolutely didn't need to make a lava cast monstrosity in order to farm Wandering Traders. If I had never upgraded to 1.18, then I still could have built a Wandering Trader Farm, and heck, I might have even built it in a non-stupid way. I think that's my main justification for downgrading to 1.17. Every single piece of progression I've done in the series was possible in 1.17, and outside of the lava cast monstrosity going down so low in the world, I haven't actually used anything from 1.18. After all, the big changes made by 1.18 were all to the game's world generation code, and sure there were changes to the world height and the mob spawning conditions, but that only affected me on the level of I built stuff lower down, and I was able to use a few less torches around the base. I could probably spend another few minutes trying to justify the world downgrade here, but honestly, you guys are like 45 minutes into this episode, I assume you're okay with it by now. Let's just downgrade the world and see what happens. Okay, I had to pull a few shenanigans to get this world to load in 1.17, but I think it's okay. What I actually ended up doing was I took all the block data from the world I converted using Amulet, and combined it with every other file from my actual 1.18 save. I think it worked out just fine, I mean I can't find anything wrong with their statistics or achievements, and the NPCs are all here, so I guess we can work with it. But before we do anything special, I need to fix up the base just a bit, cause hostile mobs can spawn in some funky places now. In 1.18, hostile mobs could only spawn in a light level of 0, but in 1.17, hostile mobs can spawn in in a light level as high as 6, which means I need to light this place up proactively, or else I'm going to find out where the hostile mobs spawn when a creeper turns up and blows me up. Then there's the wandering trader farm, which is a bit of a lost cause in terms of hostile mobs spawning. Yeah, this place got hit pretty hard with the light level changes. But that's not the biggest change the wandering trader farm got. If we look below, the entire thing got cut in half, revealing this really cool pattern. Meanwhile up above is... yeah. I don't think I'll be going to the Wandering Trader Farm anytime soon, or ever again for that matter. Oh, and I guess it's about time that I start revealing the secrets of this episode, in terms of how I figured out how to get a grass block going. Now, the funny thing about this episode is that I made the thumbnail with a grass block in it before I actually knew how to make a grass block. I make these thumbnails in bulk to save on time because it's really hard to align all the blocks, and I made the really ambitious assumption that by the time I was ready to record the final episode, I'd have a plan in mind on how to get a grass block. That didn't exactly pan out though, and by the time I was ready to record this thing, I had no idea how I was going to get this grass block. But I did have a few threads in my head, the main one being chunk regeneration exploits. There's a pretty famous one by DocM77 from Hermitcraft Season 8 Episode 1. Here, DocM uses this weird book to reset a chunk, 
deleting all of the block data inside and forcing the game to regenerate some new blocks. There's know, lava man. flowing, well. pouring out of the sides now. Look at that. Wait, wait, this looks different. What? what? Wait, 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 Doc. This what? is not how we left this. What is happening? And by regenerating this chunk, Dokken was able to cram eight different mob spawners into this tiny area. Oh my god. The ring that goes around the chunk was quarried out manually by Dokken and friends, and then some blocks were placed around possible dungeon spawn candidates to make sure that when the world generation code got another chance to regenerate the chunk, that a bunch of dungeons would be generated in those places. This particular chunk had a huge number of dungeon spawn candidates, and that's why so many have turned up. It's a really cool use case for a really interesting exploit, and I was hoping that I could use something similar in this world to regenerate a chunk that had grass in it. After all, the map I'm playing on here is the original one block of bedrock upload from over 10 years ago. That means if I regenerate a chunk in this map, then it'll just regenerate a normal vanilla chunk in its place, because the one block of bedrock survival map is just a regular vanilla map where I deleted all the chunks near spawn. So if I were able to regenerate those chunks, then I'd have a way of making grass. It's a really convenient technicality, and unfortunately, it doesn't really work if you're playing on a world where any newly generated chunks are going to be empty. So sorry to the people who've downloaded the official pack, because you can't actually do this. But for me, since I'm framing this entire series around this one block of bedrock map I made 10 years ago, I can get away with it. Heck, I might be one of the only people in existence who can get away with it. All thanks to this narrative thread about a crappy map that wasn't supposed to be beatable, that turned out to be extremely exploitable. But I can see it from the other perspective of, you wouldn't be able to get away with this if you were playing on your own official map. For that reason, if I continue to play this world in live streams and such, I'm probably going to undo the chunk exploit. It's an insanely overpowered exploit that works great for the hacky narrative of the series, but I don't think it's something I want to continue to exploit if I play this map long term. That doesn't mean I'm not going to use it now though. I am very much going to use it, because it's such an incredibly cool and interesting concept with so much potential that I really want to show you guys. Anyway, back to Dokium's exploit, how does it work? How is he able to regenerate a chunk in a vanilla 1.17 world? Well, first of all, this exploit wasn't created by Dokium, it was created by someone called Andrew, who made this really cool video showing off the mod he made. Yeah, I, I said mod. Sure, Doki might have been able to pull this exploit off on a vanilla Minecraft server, but I'm willing to bet he would have had to use a modded client to figure out where to place all his blocks, and again, to write the book that makes the chunk regenerate. In order to trigger a chunk regeneration here, you need a book with more than 64 kilobytes of data on a single page. Then, when the game tries to save the chunk that the book is in, it's going to fail, and then the next time you come and load the chunk, it won't be able to load it, and it'll regenerate a new one from scratch. Before I knew how this chunk regen exploit actually worked, I was really keen to use it in the series. But now that I know it requires a modded client, I don't think it's a viable option. Luckily though, no, there's still no, plenty no, of no, other no, variants no, of chunk no, regen exploits no, no, no. that work in a fairly similar vein. This next one works by using a resource pack with an infinitely small text size. When you're writing a sign in Minecraft, the amount of data you can fit onto the sign is not okay, determined by go. the number of characters, but rather the amount of space right you have. At the end. So, so with an infinitely like small text size, you can put 